OK. Volume OK in the back? All right. So today we're going to continue talking about hidden Markov models. And uh, in particular, we're going to look at both some advanced formulations of HMMs that extend them. And we're also going to look at um, a particular application, which is how HMMs are used for speech recognition. So um, we're going to first uh, go back and do some of the demos that didn't fit last class. We'll go look at those now. And then we will look at a new kind of query you can do to an HMM, which is instead of tracking a marginal probability over time, trying to instead reconstruct a most likely trajectory. And this is the other important class of queries that uh, people use HMMs for very frequently. Um, if we have time, we'll start getting into machine learning. If not, uh, either way, today's the last lecture on probabilistic inference as such. And starting either at the end of today or next class, we'll go into the final unit, which is on um, learning from data, machine learning. OK, so a couple demos to show you. Um, first of all, um, well, let's show them in context. Um, First of all, let's just remember what we introduced last time with hidden Markov models. We first started off by talking about Markov models, nothing hidden yet. And a Markov model is simply um, a time replicated Bayes net where the Bayes net is just a single variable at each time step. That means that the only actual conditional probabilities in here are how the variable x at one time depends on the x of the previous time. So if I give you, um, in order to specify a Markov model, I give you the, cr the initial state, the marginal probability of x1, that's actually the less interesting thing, right? Um, and the more interesting thing is how the x's evolve over time. These are called transition uh, probabilities or dynamics models because they specify our probabilistic statement of how the world tends to evolve. We drew these in a couple of ways, and we're going to see a new way today. One way we can draw a conditional probability of how um, a state x evolves over time is in what looks like a finite automaton. And here, these circles are not random variables. They're states. So x here might take the values rain and sun. There's two nodes in this graph, and therefore there are, uh, there are um, two states in the event space of x. And the conditional probabilities of time given previous time are given by the arrows and the numbers. So the probability of sun given uh, the previous time step had rain, you can read off here as 0.3. OK, and these self loops, like rain going to rain, those will have big numbers. Like here, uh, it, if it's rainy, it tends to be rainy the next day with probability 0.7. Those self loops will have big numbers if this is the kind of Markov model that is uh, kind of sticky, meaning it's slow to evolve. Things mostly stay in their current state and occasionally transition. And that's going to be relevant for some of the other things we'll talk about later. Hidden Markov models take that same backbone of how a state evolves over time. And rather than just basically being able to predict out into the future, which, as we saw last time, sooner or later means you kind of don't know much. You end up at the stationary distribution of the Markov chain. With a hidden Markov model, every time step, there's a little bit of uncertainty injected because you're not sure how the world's going to evolve, though you've described it by a model. In addition, at every time step, you now get some evidence. So you get a sonar reading, or you get um, an acoustic signal in your speech recognizer, or some oxygen reading in a medical environment, or whatever it is. You get evidence at each time step, which compensates. So you're basically, uh, the point of these kinds of models is to reconcile information you get at every time with how you know the world evolves. And that lets you use HMMs for some very common things like smoothing out noisy signals if sometimes the evidence is kind of weird and you want to attract some slow varying underlying state or something like that. We'll actually see a use of HMMs to kind of smooth out noise when we talk about um, uh, autonomous car driving, where you don't want like a single millisecond of uh, sonar reading to cause your brakes to slam. On the other hand, you, you, know, you do want to put on the brakes if there's an obstacle. And so you want to infer what's really there on the basis of your evidence. And hidden Markov models let you do things like that. Um, the actual function that's added to a hidden Markov model that connects the, the E that you observe, the evidence, with the X that you don't um, is called the emission function here. And these emission probabilities are the probability of the evidence given the underlying state. And this actually, it probably feels a little backwards, because you think the key thing you do with, an e with evidence is you infer the underlying state. So if this is this, if you remember, there's this uh, um, kind of sad scenario from the book where uh, you're trying to figure out whether it's rainy or not, and your only clue is whether or not someone's walking by with an umbrella. You would think, well, if I see the umbrella, it's probably rainy. 
right? That's the inferential use you're going to put this probability to, but that's not the form you get. You get something that says, when it's rainy, the probability of umbrella is 0.9, and when it's rainy, the probability of no umbrella is 0.1. And then you have to use the laws of probability to flip this around and infer the underlying stuff. And you might wonder why we do this. Why do we kind of give you the probabilities in the wrong direction? Sometimes you have them in the right direction, but in general, the way we can describe a domain has to do with our understanding of the process, and very often that's a causal model, and so that cause usually proceeds from the thing you want to know about, the disease or the underlying position of the robot, and then kind of the, the directions of the arrows that are, are most appropriate for the model then result in the evidence, and then we have to flip all that over and infer backwards when it's time to answer questions. Okay, so that's reasoning over time. Markov models which don't have evidence, hidden Markov models which do, um, and the hidden Markov model case is much more interesting, right? Within a Markov model, all you can really do is talk about the stationary distribution, which is the limiting distribution uh, when you go far forward. Um, and um, however, with an HMM, we talked about an important algorithm, which is called, uh, the task is called filtering. The algorithm we used to solve the filtering task was variants of uh, what's called the forward algorithm. And really, we had these two occurrences that were stuck together. One was that whenever you have a belief um, distribution, and when we say belief distribu distribution, we mean conditional probability distribution over the hidden variable at a certain time, given evidence, right? So if I know, for example, um, given all evidence up to time t minus one, I have a, I've computed my belief of uh, the random variable at time t, so like where is the ghost now given all of my sonar readings, uh, or something like that, um, then I can take this pre-computed belief about time t minus one, and I can push it forward through time. And there were two pieces to this uh, in the exact computation. One thing, the easy one in some ways, um, was if we just wanted time to pass. So no new evidence, we just take our belief at time t minus one, and we want to push it a step forward through time. And so what we do then is we can compute our beliefs at time t, still given only the past evidence, by essentially um, taking linear combinations of our past beliefs. So what we do is we think, how likely are we to be in some particular xt? Well, we consider every xt minus one that we could have been in before, right? Because if you want to be in xt, you have to have been somewhere in the previous time step. We take the probability of, the, of being at each location in the previous time step times the transition probability of moving into xt. So, right, so if you're standing on square x right now, you had to be in some other square at previous time. For each of those squares, you say, how likely was I to be there, and then transition to uh, the target square. Okay. The next thing that we talked about is the observation step, where you take your beliefs of what's going on in the underlying state before you see evidence, and then you factor in evidence at a certain time. And this took on this very simple form. Well, it's simple except for the renormalization. The renormalization is kind of a little bit not intuitive until you're used to staring at these equations. But the part that should make sense is you've got your belief without the evidence, and you multiply for each possible location xt, for each possible value of the hidden state, you multiply it by the evidence function. So if there's a state that's very likely to produce the evidence, it's going to have a big number. And if you have a state that's very unlikely to produce the evidence, even if you had previously uh, thought it was a likely hidden value, you're now going to downweight that. Okay, so you multiply those, you take a pointwise product of the evidence function and the belief function, and then when you renormalize that, you now have an updated belief. Um, that process is sometimes called belief, belief updating for that reason. Okay, so um, just to remind you concretely what that's doing, let's look back at this demo. Um, uh, let's do the circles. Okay, so this, if you remember, this is before I have any evidence, the ghost could be anywhere, and this is with a single ghost. And if I take a bunch of readings, I'm now pretty sure where the ghost is. So right now, I actually effectively know where the ghost is, um, and this is my belief distribution. It's basically collapsed down to a single location. And if time passes and I don't get any new evidence in, what's going to happen is that 1.0 will move around in accordance to what I think the process is. And in this case, it's kind of a, a, a circular uh, process. So it's probably going to move, I, I think, it's south. Um, and, but there's, there's some blur, and that blur reflects the fact that the transition model uh, allows for some noise. If it were a deterministic transition model, the 1.0 would just kind of walk around, and I would always be able to track it because um, there's no uncertainty. And as I kind of go without observations, things get blurry, but if I kind of do some new observations, then you can see that um, my beliefs sharpen again. 
Okay, so this process of um, tracking these numbers as a big vector of a probability for each underlying state, that's what the forward algorithm does, and you can see that, um, you can see that in action in your project uh, force. Okay, we'll skip that. Okay, so, um, how many of you have started project four? How many of you finished project four? Okay, project four is up, and, uh, and I, I, think it's, I, think it's, uh, I think it's the coolest project, but um, you can judge for yourself. Anyway, so um, one possible way of tracking a hidden state is, that for, is the forward algorithm. What you do is at all times you have a vector that for every possible value of the hidden state, and for Ghostbusters it's where is the ghost, for robot tracking it's where is my robot, for speech recognition it's kind of what part of what word am I saying, um, for, you have this giant vector that for every possible state lists a probability, and you operate over vectors of probabilities. What particle filtering does um, as an approximation to that is it says, instead of kind of considering every possibility, we're just gonna have a couple sample hypotheses, right? And that means there are gonna be hypotheses that aren't represented in our samples, and that's gonna be okay. So the important thing is we don't actually, in these applications, we don't want the whole vector, we just want an idea about what's going on um, that's an approximated in some sample-based way. And so in particle filtering, you consider, say, 100, 1,000, 100,000, um, snapshots of where you might be in the hidden state. And so the map shows that here. Rather than for each square centimeter of this map having a probability, instead we've got you know, 15 um, possible places we might be. Okay, and we're always gonna maintain a bunch of hypotheses, and we're gonna be moving these hypotheses around and, uh, in response to um, both the passage of time and, and evidence. So we talked about this last time too. The way particle filtering works is that at all times, even though conceptually we imagine um, even though conceptually we imagine, uh, let's try that again. Okay, conceptually we imagine we still have our state space, and here the state space is a three by three grid, and we, we still kind of imagine that we're tracking a belief over this. In fact, what we do is we have a list of particles or hypotheses, right? So each particle is a specific assignment to the hidden variable, right? And they can repeat. So in this particular one, the particle three comma three occurs five times. There's one particular green one that's been highlighted here for this slide, but there's kind of five particles that all represent the same hypothesis. That's unusual. In most applications of particle filtering, you have many, many fewer particles than you have hidden states, and so almost all hidden states are unrepresented by particles. Okay, but in this case, we've got these 10 particles, and they represent our belief. So if you stopped me now and said, what's the probability of three comma three, according to these samples, I would have to say five out of 10, which is 0.5, right? Similarly, if you asked me what's the probability of this, I would have to say, according to my samples, I would say zero, right? So what you probably wouldn't do with particle filtering is you probably wouldn't use it to answer the question, what is the single square that is most likely, right? Because there's a whole bunch of squares that have one particle and a whole bunch of squares that have zero, and you don't want to just be picking amongst the ones. What you might want to say is kind of, where's my average mean expected position or something like that? And that might be more meaningful with particles. In any case, you have all of your particles. When time passes, you pick up each of these particles, and it's like prior sampling in a Bayes net. You say, all right, well, I, I know the value of x t minus one, time to pick a value for x t. And so you pull out your transition probabilities which specify a distribution over x t given x t minus one. You pull them out and you say, all right, right now x t minus one is three comma three. All right, with probability 0.5, it's gonna move one square to the south. And then you flip a coin and you simulate. And when you simulate these five particles that right now happen to represent the same hypothesis, they may diverge because some of them will take the left path and some of them will take the right path. And so they'll spread out naturally. Right, so even though they right now have the same uh, current location, they might have different fates in the simulation. So you end up with new particles. The new particles are actually the same as the old particles. Each one is an old particle that's just kind of been through a simulator and now has, re represents a different hidden state according to the transition probabilities. Okay, and you'll build this for, for your, uh, you'll build this for your, your project force. All right, <clears throat> so the next thing that happens is evidence comes in. So for example, in this Ghostbuster scenario, I might get a red reading, meaning ghost is close in this uh, square that's shown with, a, with a uh, uh, dark red square around it. And in that case, what you would do is you go particle by particle, and each particle now may be more or less compatible with the evidence. So this green particle is really compatible with the evidence. The probability, if that green particle were the truth, of seeing this evidence is really high. So you might only multiply it by something like 0.9. Okay, so that's shown here. On the other hand, this particle here was a perfectly good hypothesis a second ago, but now it's totally in conflict with the evidence. And so maybe the probability of getting that red evidence in that square 
if you actually had the hidden value being uh, the ghost being in that state, maybe it's very unlikely. And so that particle, I don't know where he is, he's like here or something, um, that particle is suddenly going to have a low weight. So we had all these particles, our, all particles are kind of created equal um, uh, for these first two phases, and as soon as you see evidence, now some of the particles match the evidence better. So they all get a weight which comes from the evidence function. What's that? That's this emission probability P of E given X. All right, so you go to each particle and you assign it a probability based on how well it matches the evidence. Now you could stop here. Right? This step would be like likelihood weighting. Right? In likelihood weighting, we don't simulate and take whatever we get, like we do when we elapse time here. In likelihood weighting, we know what the value of the evidence variable is, and we just multiply in a factor to reflect the fact that we only care about the fraction of outcomes that match our evidence. Okay, so everybody gets weights. The thing that's new in particle filtering that you didn't have in prior sampling or likelihood sampling is that um, in, likelihood, in likelihood weighting, you get weighted particles, and we don't want weighted particles, right? We would like our particles to kind of like teleport over to the high weight regions of the space. And so what we do is we have another step that's called the resampling step. And in the resampling step, we actually discard all of our old particles. So if we're tracking 10 particles, we throw away the old ones, and we come up with 10 new ones. How do we come up with 10 new ones? Well, we actually sample them from the old ones. So when you sample them from the old ones, it turns out this guy at 3.2, he's pretty likely to get resampled, and he may actually show up a couple times, right? He may get cloned. So you sample new particles from your old particles, and that may seem strange because you're throwing out some of your old particles, but the idea is the old particles that were up here that were basically kind of being representing hypotheses that were probably false, they're probably going to be lost in this resampling step, and that's fine because they were kind of unlikely to begin with. And similarly, the regions of the space that are very likely, you may only have one or two hypotheses sitting there, but this is where all the action is. And so in this resampling state, you may double, triple, you know, whatever the number of hypotheses that are there. Okay, so the samples kind of move towards the regions of high probability, and that's good because it means your resolving power, right? Your resolving power is where these dots land, and you want them to be in the high probability regions. So this resampling is a good thing. So let me, uh, let me show you in the applet, and then we're, I'm going to show you in a couple other ways. Okay, so here is um, that same uh, uniform distribution. This is what a uniform distribution looks like when you only have a couple of samples to back it up. The samples are kind of scattered, but like, look, you know, there ha happen to be five samples that land here, and no samples landed there. This is what samples look like, right? And so if I asked you right now, um, what's the most likely location? Well, that would, you know, you might say, okay, this 0.05 is more likely, but that's maybe not a reliable way to use samples. It might actually be better to ask questions like, what's the average location of the ghost, right? And if you look for the average, you say it's probably in the, the average location is in the center. That doesn't mean that the ghost is probably in the center, that's just the average location. Um, that's something that's more reliable to estimate from these samples. But in any case, as I start observing evidence, what you see is, instead of having like a, a bunch of samples spread out everywhere, uh, what we have now is we have um, a large number of samples all sitting on this one square. So the samples are kind of moving towards the high probability regions. And then as time passes, they kind of spread out. And as I get kind of evidence, um, they're going to, OK, this is kind of getting some contradictory evidence here. Now they're going to kind of move around. And if I get more evidence, they're going to maybe, now I think I'm over here. OK, so this, this kind of affects where, where as I get evidence, I'm totally revising my belief. Part of why you're seeing this in this apple is because there aren't that many particles and uh, you're getting some sampling issues. Okay, I can rerun that with tons of particles here and it's gonna look more or less like the exact. The only reason you can tell it's not exact here is there's kind of point zero ones floating around. But now, as I make observations, um, again, all of my particles kind of flock towards the high probability regions and that's good. Now in this space, it doesn't matter. It's not that expensive to, to, to kind of write down all these numbers and using particle filtering on this grid is kind of silly, right? because it's not that expensive to write down the exact probability for every square, but that's going to be different in some larger games. Okay, uh, you can do particle filtering with just a single particle, but you shouldn't, right? So this is what a uniform distribution looks like with a single particle, right? Now, if I elapse time, the particle like gets simulated around, right? It's just one. This isn't all that informative. It's only once you have a thousand of these all superimposed, each one kind of following its own simulation that the aggregate effects become believable. Okay, any questions about any of those demos or ghostbuster -y kind of things? Yep. Oh, great question. So how, basically, uh, to repeat the question, how, do you, how many particles should you have for a certain state space size? 
there's no simple answer because it's not just about the number of states. It's about kind of where the probability is. So that's actually a great lead in. I think I can answer that maybe better um, on the next slide, which is, um, so what do you do with particle filtering if it's not kind of tracking ghosts around a small grid? Well, one big application is for robot localization. And this will actually give you a sense for why particles. Right? So let's say I wanted to take um, a robot like the PR2 that we have in Sutar Jedi um, that Peter's group works with. And we wanted to kind of have it track itself as it goes down the hallways. right? Um, and how does it know where it is? Well, it's got some sensors. It's got some sonar readings. And it's got a, maybe a map of the floor. So maybe you actually know you've got this directory, right? And you're trying to figure out where the you are here sign goes. So um, what's the state space? Right? We know what the observations are. The observations are, I fire sonar in this direction, or in this case, laser. I fire a laser in this direction, and I see how far the wall is. I fire one in this direction, and see how the wall, far the wall is. And I do this in a bunch of different directions. And I get, kind of get the sense that there's kind of a wall in front of me and a wall to my left, but no wall to my right. That's the kind of information you would get from the reading. Now, where are you? Are you in Sutar Jedi? Are you in Soda Hall? Are you like, you know, in the BART? You don't really know, right? And so um, the space in which you could be is very, very large, right? You could discretize the whole of campus into one centimeter by one centimeter squares, and that's a really big vector to be calculating probabilities over. OK, so we don't do that. What we do is we maintain, here are a 1,000 places the robot might be, right? And maybe 99% of those are concentrated within a 10-foot square area where we're pretty sure the robot is. So in this case, having lots of, it's like the ocean, right? Swimming in the ocean, you only use the top couple feet, right? It's the same kind of thing. Your state space can be very large. All that matters is the kind of complexity in the region that you have any probability. So let me show you, uh, let me show you um, some examples of particle filtering at work. And actually, uh, I like this particular demo. This is from the University of Washington. I like this particular one because um, it shows that really the number of particles doesn't just depend on the size of the state space. It depends on where you are in your computation. Um, so for example, at the beginning, um, OK, try that again. So much for that demo. Um, try that again. Gonna work there. Okay, let's try that a third time. Okay. All right. So here is um, here is a map somewhere in uh, Seattle, and um, the red dots represent hypotheses of where the robots might be, and that is, in other words, samples from the state space, which is x, y positions on this map. So the spa state space here is actually infinite, right? If you don't discretize it, it's actually an infinite state space. But that's fine, because your samples can just as easily be 40,000 locations from a continuous space as 40,000 locations from a discrete space. That's one great thing about particle filtering, is when you switch to a continuous space, kind of nothing changes. OK, so there's 40,000 of them, because you could be anywhere. Now, very quickly, what happens is um, you see these these blue lines, they represent range finder readings in each of various directions. So as readings start coming in, you take these samples and you downweight them uh, if they're not likely to produce this pattern of ranges, right? So this pattern of ranges makes sense if you're kind of, uh, if there's a wall below you and to the, the left, but th it wouldn't really make sense if there were kind of walls all around you. You wouldn't be, be you, you would be getting reports back sooner. All right, so you take a lot of these particles. Now, um, even though there are a lot of them, a lot of them aren't compatible with the data. OK, and so here the estimated robot position is kind of bogus. Um, and what happens is as you start collecting data, so okay, I'll stop it right there. What's happened? All of the hypotheses that were in kind of you know, corners and closets were not compatible with kind of the continuous open space readings that you've been getting. And so those particles are starting to vanish. Why do they vanish? They vanish because they're given a small weight in the weighting step. And then in the resampling step, they don't get cloned. And so um, there may still be 40,000 particles, but they're now kind of congregating in regions that are compatible with the evidence so far. Was there a question? Yep. Yeah, I know, flying robots, I don't know. Um, something's going on in the, these particles here. I'm not really sure. No idea. That's actually a great question. OK. No idea. 
All right, so in any case, you keep gathering. Now, it doesn't mean the robot's there. This is not actually where the robot is, though at this time in the simulation they knew and they could show that. This is a reconstructive position. How do you reconstruct this? Well, you know, each particle is presumably at a different xy coordinate because these are real numbers. So you could look for a region that's dense, or you could look at it for an average region, and then your robot would always be in the center. Um, it's really hard if this is your belief function to really guess where you are. Right? You don't know. Lots of particles because you need to cover all these hypotheses. Right? Any place that's white, you just can't ever figure out that you're there uh, again. Right? So now what happens is, as more um, information comes in, you basically now know you're in a hallway because you've gone for a while, right? This robot's moving, and as it's moving, it's continuing to see free space in front of it. That means it's been in a hallway for a while, and any location for which you couldn't have been in a hallway for a while, they're starting to have only very kind of sparse hypotheses. You might still want some, and, and that's good. Samples, you know, they kind of do the right thing. There are fewer samples, but not none in regions of lower probability. Okay, so this kind of all collapses, and what you can see now is down here that 40,000 is shrinking, right? As your belief function contracts in space, you don't need as many samples to do a good job, right, where that would have to be formalized in some way, but you don't need as many samples to do a good job in representing it for practical purposes. All right. So, and as you continue to know you're in open space, now you know you're in one of the long corridors, and actually look where it thinks the robot probably is. There's a lot of samples over there on the, on, on the east, and you're seeing open space. Now, if these samples were correct, you should very soon see a wall, right? Because the robot's moving forward. So if, you, if those samples are right, we should see a wall. And if we don't see, and if we don't, uh, see that wall, then these samples are going to get downweighted and they'll disappear. And so you'll see exactly that happen right now. These samples kind of, they become inconsistent with the evidence, they disappear, and now essentially your belief function collapses. And you don't know exactly where you are, but you know you're basically in this part of this hallway. And so now you've only got a couple hundred particles, but they're all kind of clouded around the right location so that as errors accumulate, you can kind of shift uh, their center of mass um, uh, in the appropriate way. Okay, so there's kind of this belief cloud. And you'll notice that it kind of expands when you get into an open area because you're not really sure where you are. And then as soon as you start seeing walls, that evidence is better at contracting and localizing you. So you see it kind of expand um, and so on. Okay, and you can see now we can get away with kind of uh, one one hundredth of the number of samples. So that's the kind of thing you can do in particle filtering. In project four, you just have a constant number of samples. Uh, but one thing you can do with, uh, with, with particle filtering is, uh, is kind of use it to, um, use it to uh, uh, deal with continuous spaces. The other kind of thing you can do with particle filtering, sorry, yep. It's a great question. How do you, how, wh what was decreasing the number of samples? They've got a slightly snazzier uh, algorithm which is adaptively deciding how many particles you need. So typically you've got a robot, it's got some compute, and you can use that compute for kind of finitely many things. It computes a resource. And so if you don't need to be spending all your time on particle filtering, you want to have a smaller number. The algorithm we've presented just says there are n particles and you always have n particles. But in practice, people often reduce the number of particles to save compute. To only have one particle. The problem with only one particle is uh, you don't get this effect of uh, kind of what if you're wrong? It's still the only particle, right? So even if it gets a very small weight, it still gets chosen again. You need enough particles to kind of cover your various hypotheses. You actually get the opposite problem. In practice and particle filtering, it's often a problem in practice uh, that all of your particles will collapse down to one location because you've assumed the evidence errors are independent. They're not, and so you're kind of all your hypotheses are right on top of each other, and then if it turns out those hypotheses are all wrong, now you've got a problem because you can't recover. So real particle filtering often injects some extra kind of noise uh, to compensate for uh, independence errors. Okay. Particles, so far we've been talking about them as being like a hypothesis of a location, but a particle can be a hypothesis of anything you don't know, your whole hidden state. Okay, so in particular, um, in addition to localization, right, that's uh, where you know the map but you don't know where you are and you're like comparing the walls you see with the walls that exist on the map in your evidence function, there's also what's called SLAM, simultaneous localization and mapping. And here, this is when you like throw a robot into a building and say, go explore. You don't know where you, what the map is, and you don't know where you are on this map that you don't know. Okay, so your state has to consist of not only your location, but also the map. 
So one hypothesis is it's a giant circular room and I'm in the corner. Another hypothesis is it's a spiral and I'm in the middle. And right, your hypotheses have to cover a lot more information, which means now you can start to see that you might not have no hypotheses that are even close to correct if you're not careful. Um, so I'm going to show you a little bit about what, uh, just what SLAM looks like. Um, let's see whether this one works. Nope. Also, no. Uh, Slam. Okay. Slam's actually extremely cool. Um, so here's what Slam looks like. Okay, the robot's always in the center. That's the one thing you know, right? You take this kind of relativistic approach. You know where you are. You're in the middle. What you don't know is what anything around you looks like. Um, and so the hypotheses here are a, a map of what might be around you, right? And how do we show those? You kind of superimpose them. So you'll see these kinds of maps all kind of uh, laid out on top of each other. All right, so what you're seeing here is it's mapping. It's kind of seeing where the walls are. And um, okay, there's these green dots, right? You're actually not. This is your uncertainty in your location as you go uh, down the hall. So you went down the hall, and you're mostly uncertain about your left to right position. And then as you turn, right, your uncertainty cloud doesn't turn with you, right? It's, it's, it's just uncertainty in x, y. And so now it's kind of facing in the other direction. It's going to widen in the other direction. And this robot right now is walking, a, is walking around a loop, right? And so what's going to happen is as you get to the end of the loop, you're going to get to a position where, uh, let's see if I can stop it at just the right time. Your uncertainty is kind of accumulating with respect to your start position. And so as you get to a position here, you're not really sure whether this map is going to be a kind of a nice closed loop or whether it's a spiral and you're about to start out into the next hallway out. Right? And so what's going to happen is we'll get to a point where we see evidence. Right? So right now, we don't know whether the, this, this, this loop is going to close. We're going to see evidence that it is, in fact, a closed loop. And all of our hypotheses that represent spirals are all going to go away. And so this cloud of hypotheses is going to snap to something that's much more rectified. So I'll show you that here. You can see uh, as you get around the loop, um, everything kind of snaps close. That really, that snap there was when you actually got back to your starting location, and you knew that a bunch of hypotheses that involve your starting location being inconsistent just went away. And so things kind of uh, uh, straighten up. So that's a case where, where you're not just accumulating uncertainty. Your knowledge about the physics of the world lets you, uh, lets you kind of throw out some of those hypotheses. OK. All right. Um, any questions on any of that particle filtering stuff? I'm going to very quickly talk about dynamic Bayes nets, and then we're going to spend the uh, second half of the lecture today talking about speech. OK, so what's a dynamic Bayes net? A dynamic Bayes net is a Bayes net that's kind of replicated through time. An HMM is a particular one. But the typical case for a dyna dynamic Bayes net is there's a whole bunch of variables you want to track over time. Like this might be in a medical situation, and you want to track heart rate and blood pressure and a whole bunch of other variables at every time slice. Okay. Um, you might have multiple sources of evidence, and you might have those, those variables themselves influencing each other in a given time. You'll see this in kind of a simple dynamic, dynamic Bayes net in your uh, project fours, and there what you'll see is you're going to have two ghosts you're tracking, not just one. Each ghost gives you a sonar reading, so so far that's two ghost random variables you don't observe, each coupled to a single evidence variable that you do observe, and this gets replicated through time. So these same ghosts occur at every time step, um, and the interesting thing is that they're not each on their own independent hidden Markov model. So um, for example, you might have that the two ghosts are, uh, they tend to move towards each other, and they tend to move away from each other. And um, if they tend to move away from each other, then the position of ghost uh, B at time two depends not only on where it was in the previous time step, which you also don't know, but also on where ghost A was. And so these variables couple over time. And you can see that here in this Bayes net where um, G2B here, the position of ghost B at time two depends both on its position in the previous time step and on something about ghost A. In this case, the dependence on ghost A is within a time step, but you can imagine doing it otherwise. OK. In fact, that's one of the like, little edge cases you have to get just right in, uh, in your project force. OK. So at time t1, time t2, these things just kind of replicate out, out um, as far as you want. So you can think of this as kind of like an HMM that has multiple hidden variables and multiple observed variables. But of course, in the general case, there's no reason you couldn't also have G2A depending on, like, uh, I, don't, I don't know whether, uh, whether or not the Pac-Man's in a powered up mode or something like that. There can be evidence that from above as well. You can kind of have arbitrary Bayes nets. And HMM is just a very simple case that has some nice algorithms. OK, so the generalization of HMMs. Um, and 
you could just run uh, you could just run variable elimination. You kind of unroll the the you unroll this thing so it looks like this. You unroll it and then you start eliminating variables. So you eliminate this and you eliminate this and you start eliminating variables according to the generic procedure, and that would work just fine. <clears throat> um, typically, people are going to use particle filters for this as well. And what a particle here is, just like in that case where your particles were complex and they were the map and your position, that's a kind of dynamic Bayes net. Here are your particles. If you're tracking two ghosts, a single particle would be a full assignment to the world. So both ghosts assigned together, right? So a particle is a full assignment to the hidden states. And then when you elapse time, you kind of go through the Bayes net. And for each variable, you simulate according to the structure of the network. So in that case, you might simulate a new position for each of the the ghosts, and when you see evidence, you multiply in all of the likelihood function terms for the entire configuration, and then you do resampling again. So particle filtering really doesn't change at all. The only thing that changes is your state space now has multiple variables, and so each sample has all of those variables jointly, right? They're all assigned together. It's not like ghost A has his particles and ghost B has her particles, right? Okay, um, but other than that, particle filtering is basically unchanged, which is, which is nice. You'll see that in your project four. All right, I'm going to talk about most likely, likely explanation um, and um, get a little bit into speech recognition. Let's actually take a, a quick kind of two minute stretch break right now, and then we'll get into that. All right, uh, let's get started again. So, in a most likely explanation query, you see your evidence, and you're not trying to figure out what's going on right now, right? Um, you're not trying to figure out where is the robot at this time step. Instead, you're trying to figure out what is the sequence of hidden states that is most likely um, for this whole time period. So you see here the inspector robot trying to figure out the whole sequence of actions that's most likely given the observations. Um, we still have the HMM. It's still defined by a set of states which are hidden, a set of observations which are observed. Um, an initial distribution, a transition function, and an emission function. None of that has changed. The only new thing we're doing is this uh, HMM, which represents a joint, probability, um, a joint probability distribution over all of these variables. Now we're going to ask a new question at inference time. Now we're going to say, given all my evidence, what is the single assignment to all of the x values which is most likely? And that's different before. Before we were marginalizing out x1 through 3 and asking about just x4. Now we want to know an assignment to everything. And you get a new algorithm for doing this that actually looks just like the forward algorithm. It's called the Viterbi algorithm. You basically change one sum sign into a max, and you're done. So I'm actually going to go through the algorithm pretty quickly, because it's so much like the forward algorithm. And instead, I'm going to spend most of the rest of the time today talking about how speech recognition works, because that's a case of something that doesn't really look on the surface like an HMM, but in practice is solved with HMMs today. OK, so uh, when we think about paths through uh, a sequence of states, people often draw this other kind of notation, which is called a trellis or a lattice, um, where on the x-axis is time. So time goes from left to right here. That's n time steps. And on the y-axis is the states in, um, in x, the possible hidden states. Now, in this case, the states are just sun and rain. Um, and even though time has kind of a direction, the ordering here in the states is just some arbitrary thing. It's not like there's, they're not actually on some linear axis. So each time step in this particular sun and rain HMM, there's only two states you can be in, and so this lattice is kind of small. Now, what we do is we have a bunch of arcs here. And so this arc here, let's say this one, represents going from um, sun at time two to rain at time three. Okay, So each arc represents a certain um, little piece of a path through history. In addition, with each arc, we associate a, a, a weight. OK, and the weight we associate with this arc, so if I kind of pull this arc out here, I associate with this the probability that x3 equals rain given that x2 equals sun. Right? It makes sense that that probability is on this arc, right? because this arc represents that transition. Um, what else is re represented there is evidence isn't shown here, but maybe there was some evidence at this time, like umbrella. Umbrella. We would have probability of umbrella given x. Um, prob I guess that's probability of umbrella at time 3, given that x3 equals rain. So at each arc, we get a probability for one transition to move into that state 
and the emission from that state that corresponds to the evidence. So two factors on each arc. All right, what does that mean? That means if I asked you the question, well, um, could you have been sunny every day, right? So there's some evidence here that's not shown, but sunny every day is this path through the lattice, right? Straight across, across the top. Rainy every day is the bottom path. The history where it's sun, then rain, then sun is kind of this path through where you alternate. And so every possible sequence of states over time is a path through this lattice. And so what people do is you think about um, either trying to compute, if you want the marginal probability of, say, sun at time n, that's the sum of all paths that reach that state at that time. So we would sum all paths that get to that point. And if I want the best path, if I want the, the most likely way of um, being sunny at time n, I would want the single um, heaviest path, right, uh, highest probability of weights that ends up at this point. OK, so now we can think about all of our algorithms in terms of um, these nodes in this graph, and then either thinking of the sum of all paths that reach them or the max of all paths. And that gives rise to the forward and, uh, and Viterbi algorithm. So for example, um, if we have the forward algorithm, what are we computing? We're computing for, uh, you go left to right, and for each time slice, you compute a vector, one for each state, which is the sum of all paths that reach that state. So for sun, we want the, the, the total probability of getting to sun, and that's going to be the sum of all of the paths. And the way we do that is we do it with a one-step recurrence. This is the forward algorithm. You already know this. So if I want to know the sum of all paths that get here, I would say, all right, the probability of xn equals sun um, and all of my evidence, whatever it is, um, that's going to be, well, it's going to be a, a sum of all of the incoming paths. So I'm going to sum up all of the incoming paths. And then if you work that out with the forward algorithm, that's going to be that expression that we derived last time, where you take um, the total probability of being in this square, right, and that sums everything that's behind it, and multiply in that transition. And then you take the total probability of being in rain, and you put it through that tra transition, and you add them up. Okay, that's the forward algorithm. If you want to, instead of knowing the best, the, the sum of all paths, which is a marginal probability, instead you want the best path you do the exact same thing, except now, at each time slice as we go left to right, for each state, I don't keep track of the sum of paths. I keep track of the best path to each point. OK, so now, same kind of reasoning. If I want to know the best path to get to sun, and I know the best path to get to this sun, maybe it's across the top, and I know the best path to get to here, and maybe it's some wiggly thing, right? then the best path to get to sun is either um, the best path to get to sun at time n is either the best way of getting to some sun at time n minus 1 or the best way of getting to rain at times n minus 1, followed by the appropriate transition. And that's what's shown here. If you want the maximum path to get to a certain state, then what you do is you look backwards one time step. You find all of the maximum paths from where you might have been in the last step. And then you multiply by the appropriate transition, which is a transition probability times an F times an evidence probability. Okay. That's it. It's very helpful to sit down yourself, rederive these, make sure all of the t's and t minus ones make sense and you didn't lose an evidence term somewhere. But that's the basic idea. You redo the forward algorithm essentially exactly, but we're used to sum over all of the previous possibilities. Um, you now take a max. Okay. So formally, it's in fact the same algorithm. Uh, you've just swapped summing for, for maxing. And if, uh, uh, if you're an... Uh, uh, math type that's just a uh, same algorithm in a different semi -ring. Yes? Yeah, so the question is where the evidence is, and uh, this, is, this is one of the ways in which this isn't a good uh, representation, but if you imagine the evidence was kind of umbrella, not umbrella, umbrella, not umbrella, then the, the, the fact that rain, that sun is unlikely with umbrella is that kind of this arc up here uh, this arc up here will be a smaller weight than it would be here, right? Because sun going to sun with umbrella is going to be a smaller probability than sun going to sun without umbrella. So the evidence terms are on the arcs. They're just, uh, they're just not, they're not actually associated with a pair of states. So the evidence term you get from arc A here and the evidence term you get on arc B are actually the same because the evidence only uh, involves the head of the, the arc. Any other questions?
sorry, should the should the should it be what? That's this. Oh, uh, right, because it doesn't depend. You could put it here if you wanted. It just doesn't actually depend on the previous state. It's the same points on the previous question. Also a good question. OK, other questions? This definitely something you want to sit down and work through on your own, kind of going through detailed derivations in class with sub t's and sub t minus 1's. It's not the way to get these equations. You want to sit down and kind of just uh, turn the probabilities on your own. OK. What I will try to do today is give you a sense of how large-scale HMMs can solve problems that don't look like tracking robots through time um, and space. We talked a little bit in the very first class, and we'll come back much later in the last couple classes uh, to talk about applications of AI, one of which is natural language processing. That's actually my research area. Um, and there are a bunch of different ways in which natural language gets used with AI techniques. One is speech technologies, like uh, this is primarily what's going on in Siri or any dialogue manager, where you're recognizing the speech, you're doing some dialogue processing, and then you're synthesizing new speech. Um, there's a whole other class of things that involve understanding language and doing other manipulations with it, like answering a question based on a query uh, and some web text, or translating from one language to another, web search, spam filters, all of these things. We're going to talk about several of these at different points in the, uh, in the class, um, and uh, maybe we'll talk a little bit about how Watson works here. Today, I just want to zoom in here and talk about how speech recognition works. So this is uh, you talk into a microphone, and words appear on your screen, and you hope they correspond to what you said. Okay. Um, how many of you have used a dictation system where you just basically talk and it takes notes? Okay, a couple. Uh, how many of you had a good experience with that? Some. So it, you know, it depends on a lot of things, like have you, tr have you trained the system for you? Do you have a good microphone? I'm going to talk about how these systems work. Um, really, this is a case where the difference between the cheapest stuff that's deployed and the best research systems is actually a pretty big gap. Um, one of the reasons why some new systems, like if you're talking into Siri and you get good results from the speech recognition, one of the reasons why uh, it works so well is aside from the fact that the microphones are now better, uh, a lot of the speech recognition is now happening on servers that have a ton of data, um, as opposed to what can happen on your laptop with just a small amount of data. Um, as with many things in AI, more data makes the system work much better. OK, so how speech recognition work? We want to build, let's say, a system that's going to transcribe our, our, our words in the simplest case. Well. Let's kind of, uh, I'm going to describe the phenomenon, and then I'm going to describe how it's formalized and why it's formalized as an HMM. So the first uh, uh, thing to know is kind of how speech actually works. Why is this a thing that can be uh, boiled down to evidence in an HMM? Well, when I talk, right, how do you hear it? There's basically pressure waves that are set up in the air. That's how speech is transmitted. And there are pressure uh, waves that increase and decrease pressure in the air. If you speak into a microphone, well, there's a bunch of different kinds of microphone technology, but like the simplest kind of microphone is basically a piece of paper with a magnet on it. And as the air kind of increases and decreases pressure, this piece of paper moves, the magnet moves, and then that creates some electrical current, which is transcribed. So somehow, these pressure waves in the air are turned into um, electrical currents. And then um, probably all of you have seen wave files that look something like this, where there's just kind of zigzags going up and down. Um, um, and those, those represent, essentially, the um, transduction from the speech waves in the air. Okay. So the first thing you do is you digitize it. Now all that stuff about air and dynamics and microphones is gone. You've got a digitized signal um, that every, at every time slice gives you uh, and kind of up and down pressure wave amplitude. If you zoom in on that, I don't know if you ever have, if you zoom in on that, speech looks a little bit like this. So this is somebody saying speech lab. There's a bunch of things to notice about this. Uh, the first thing is it doesn't really work the way you might think. So for example, if you think about the sounds in speech lab, if you think about just the S, s right, what does an S sound like? It sounds like noise, right? Relatively, it's kind of uh, relatively high frequency noise. And you can kind of see that here, right? That, that during the S, there's not really any kind of regular pattern, but something's going on really fast, right? Now you might think about a P. Think about a P. It sounds like something in your head when you think about it. But it turns out when you close your lips and you kind of make the P sound, it sounds like this. Sounds like silence, because when you close your lips, nothing happens, right? So in fact, if you look, what, what you think of in your head as the sound P is, in fact, just complete silence. It's the same as any other kind of silence. It's weird. You might say, but it sounds like a P to me. The reason it sounds like a P to you is it impacts the next vowel. Your brain does all kinds of manipulations of this so that you hear it slightly differently. But if you actually look at the hard data, the P is silent, and then the following vowel is a mess. OK, what do vowels look like? There's some repeating structure. And if you zoom in on it, this repeating structure 
mm, it's not like a, the cleanest sine wave ever, but you can certainly see that there's some repeating structure, and therefore that might give you a sense that the real way to understand the signal is by looking at the frequencies that are present. Okay, what else, uh, what else is there to know? A B basically looks like a P. Um, and you can broadly characterize speech as like silences with some uh, kind of quasi-regular structure in between, okay? That's what speech looks like. Nobody really uh, does speech recognition directly on this representation because it's just, it's too hard for a couple reasons. One is information's kind of smeared across the time domain, like where does the P actually occur? And the other thing is that um, it's just too hard to kind of eyeball this and figure out what frequencies are active, okay? Um, so what do people do? Basically, Fourier transforms. Um, how many have you? How many of you kind of know what goes on in your inner ear a little bit? How many of you have seen a cutaway like this? So uh, your ear, it turns out, is a biological device for taking a Fourier transform. Um, it's actually kind of amazing. So these pressure waves go in, and you have this eardrum, which is basically a piece of paper with a microphone attached to it, and um, and kind of you, you kind of push this drum back and forth, and there's some weird, crazy thing that looks like Dr. Seuss came up with it. But at the end, um, what happens in this spiral, which is filled with fluid, it's really quite cool. As these vibrations happen, they set up resonances in the spiral, and where you are in the spiral depends on which frequencies are in, are in the underlying signal. So you get some kind of complex signal here, and different bits of the spiral vibrate. There's a little cilia in there attached to nerve, nerves that kind, of, that kind of fire off some filter that says, this kind of thing is activated right now. It's extremely cool. It's like basically an organic Fourier transform. Um, so of course we can do that, right? We can build uh, we can build microphones, and uh, we know how to take Fourier transforms from uh, I guess E20. So um, so what we do is basically every little time slice we take a Fourier transform, and then you get something that looks a little bit more like this. At every time there are certain frequencies active, and now you can start to see things that are a little bit more interesting. Okay, so for example, that S the S in speech lab, well it looks like this, right? A, a time slice from an S, they all kind of look the same, and they're characterized by a whole bunch of frequencies being present, and those frequencies rel being relatively high-pitched. So kind of up here is high-pitched, and uh, among other things, your telephone actually cuts off right about here. So everything kind of in the top half of this is gone. This is why in a telephone you can't tell an F from an S. Right? They just decided you didn't need those frequencies anyway. Um, so that's what an S looks like, and now you can see like an E has, a, has kind of signature frequencies. Now, if you look really closely, you can see the beginning of the E is weird. That's because it's next to a P. So, of course, this has to be contextual. The way you tell there's a P there at all is by knowing that this is the kind of E that happens next to P's, not by looking closely at this silence and telling that that's special silence, right? All silence looks the same. In speech, there's a sh in, uh, at the end of speech. And if you look at it, it looks just like an S, but lower frequency. So again, it's the frequencies present that are giving kind of all of the, the cues. So somehow we, we know we need to take the signal, and instead of the HMM's evidence being kind of how high up that wave file is, the evidence has got to be a vector of frequencies or something very much like that. And the vector of frequencies you get is a clue to see what kind of sound is being uttered at the moment. Okay. Now what you can't do is you can't go time slice by time slice saying, okay, this, what is it? Because right here you might say, oh, that's an S, and that would be great. But when you, get, when you get here to the P, you would look at that and you'd be like, oh, that's a silence, I have no idea. What the HMM lets you do is it lets you say, all right, if you're gonna say the word speech, you have to go through the P to do it, right? And it's that connectivity through the HMM that says you can't just have a silence in the middle of the word that lets you infer what's really going on here. So both the evidence is important and also the, the structure of how speech, how well-formed speech works is important. Questions on this before I go on a little bit more? Yep. Won't it be different for everybody's voice? Yeah, um, this is the amazing thing. Some things are different uh, from voice to voice and some things aren't. So if everybody had their own unique weird frequencies, it would be so hard to understand each other, right? So it turns out there's signature frequencies that are kind of common, um, and then there are kind of second order effects of what kind of exactly the, the detailed pattern is that let us, lets us distinguish each other. So there's this amazing thing when you hear speech that you can both tell who's speaking, and that's different for everybody, and you can tell what they're saying. So something has to be the same. And it's that tension between what's common and what's different that actually gives rise to a lot of uh, the details in, in the processing algorithm. You, you basically want to process away everything that's unique to you and get a representation about the stuff that's common to whoever's speaking. That's kind of sometimes called speaker normalization. Yep.
Yeah, right. So you want, there's, uh, this is called um, sometimes speaker recognition or authentication, where you want to say something. It doesn't even matter what you say. I just want to know it's you. And here what I want to do is I want to take out your vocal fingerprint and separate that from the generic structure that sounds the same for everybody. And so in some sense, the stuff that lets me know it's you, that's all you care about when you're doing authentication. And you want to totally get rid of it when you do speech recognition, or at least that's the typical way people approach. You can divide speech into kind of what's you and what's universal. Um, it's not obvious what should be you and what should be universal. So if you kind of zoom in, this is, you know, this is somebody saying, ah, zoomed in really, really, really closely. And you can see there's some kind of repeating structure. Whenever you see a repeating structure like this, even though like, it hardly looks like a sine wave, that tells you that when you take a Fourier transform, you're going to get some, something kind of meaningful out. And if you take the Fourier transform of this, um, right, there's a question of what kind of time resolution you want. There's a trade-off there. But here you would see that there's kind of some peaks in the frequency response. Those peaks correspond to something is repeating at about this frequency. Right, That's this peak. And then inside that, there's like something that's happening four times, uh, four times as frequent, and that's going to be another one of these peaks, and so on. Right. So uh, each kind of repeating structure is going to activate. And when you actually do this in the real world, all kinds of frequencies are present. It's not like when we speak, it's not like two sine waves superimposed. And that's partly because everybody's a little bit different, and it's partly because like your mouth is shaped however it is and mushy, and it's not like your if your head was a sphere, you might sound more like a sine wave. Actually, your head would have to be a tube. Um, OK, uh, let me say a little bit more about the tube that is your head. Um, so what's the process of getting these? So we're going to do a pr pretty deep dive into this, um, though you know, only about 20 minutes on this. If you want the whole version, uh, you take 288 uh, or, or the kind of uh, related linguistics classes. Um, so, so how does speech actually work? So we can think a little bit about how it's generated. Uh, it starts in your lungs, right? So your lungs push out air. I guess it actually starts with your diaphragm, right? Uh, you push out air, right? That's it, air kind of flying out. Your air goes through kind of a muscular fold in your throat uh, called your vocal folds uh, or kind of a, um, or your vocal cords uh, common. Um, and you think about this. So if you were if you were a musical instrument, you would be a kazoo. Right, so basically what happens is you have your lungs, you've got these like muscles that are holding your throat closed, and air comes out and they separate. And then as the air comes, as the kind of pressure is released, both the muscles push. Uh, the folds together and kind of just Bernoulli forces suck them closed. And then the pressure builds up and it closed. And so you basically got these kind of little bits of flesh clapping uh, like a kazoo would. And um, if you didn't have the rest of your head and you tried to talk, you'd sound just like a kazoo. Okay, so there's this like buzzing that comes from your throat. And the way that the physics work on that is there's some frequency that's um, characteristic of you, but it's not like your own personal frequency that no one else in the world has. It's kind of, you know, ma male voices are lower and female voices are higher, and there's a range of these things. There's one variable, right, uh, this frequency. The other stuff that makes you you comes later. So there's some frequency here, and you get not only that frequency, but kind of all integer multiples. That's how the physics works out. And higher multiples get less power in them, OK? So if you look at the, the frequency response, here's frequency over here, and here's um, uh, uh, and kind of uh, he here's the, the amplitude of that, then you get this is the source. This is what a kazoo sounds like. Now, of course, you when you talk don't sound like a kazoo, and that's because you do have the rest of your head. And what happens above the vocal folds is there's this like goopy mouth nasal cavity that you shape in some way by moving your tongue around. Okay, and that shape causes some resonances, some frequencies to survive, others don't, and that gives you what's called a filter function here, where based on the shape of your articulators, you get different frequencies surviving, and then you multiply those together, and you end up with an output spectrum that only has, it's kind of got an envelope that uh, has to do with the shape of the resonance, and it's got these kind of vertical striations about the specific frequencies that are present that have to do with the fundamental frequency. And as you kind of sing or you move your voice up and down um, in frequency, then those spread out, but the envelope stays the same. Okay. So this is the thing we observe, and mostly we try to extract out the envelope because it's those frequencies that matter. Questions? Okay. Um, so I said something about you're basically a tube. If you actually kind of look and you kind of slice yourself sideways, you've got your vocal folds here, and then you've got your throat, which is more or less a tube, right? And then to the extent that your nasal cavity is closed, if you kind of look at your mouth, it's more or less a tube, right? It goes from the back, it kind of curves over your tongue and arches, but it's basically a curved tube. And then if your mouth is kind of open 
but not too open. You basically have, it's basically the same thickness all the way through. And we can work out the physics for what happens when you have vibration on one end of a tube and the other end is open. Um, in fact, there are musical, plenty of musical instruments that are basically this. And we know what happens when you work out the physics of a tube, and you're not exactly a tube, but um, you're close enough, and if you work that out, uh, you basically can boil down your, your kind of mouth to being tubes of various sizes and based on where your tongue constricts. Most of the different articulation is where your tongue closes. You get different shapes. Okay, I'm gonna maybe do a demo here. Okay. All right, we asked, uh, this is a question about like, do people sound like sinusoids? No, you don't. Sinusoids sound kind of creepy. Um, Here's a sinusoid. So what this is going to do is basically, um, if you look back here for a second, you can see that um, if, if you look at all the different vowels, like ah, e, u, um, they mostly differ in where your tongue is secondarily, and at least in English, whether or not you round your lips. But um, you basically can place all of the vowels in a kind of a two-dimensional space that correspond to kind of the, the lengths of these two tubes. OK, so here's that. This is the two-dimensional space. Um, so if you go to this point in the space, um, and this corresponds to your tongue being kind of high and in the front, and if you kind of just, just turned your vocal cords on, you would go E, and in synthesis it sounds like this. So that's a creepy computer E. The difference between you, a human sounding E, and creepy computer E, is that this really is kind of two sinusoids added together. You can tell it's an E, like here's E, and here's A. Ah. It's all creepy and robot-like because all that other stuff that makes you sound nice and human is gone. And that's because you have you know, a complex resonator and this has two sinusoids. Um, but basically, this is all the vowels kind of lay out into, you can think two real numbers describe the vowel space. So ooh, oh, okay, and so on. Um, so in some sense, if it was only vowels, you could describe what's going on at any time with a single, with two real numbers, kind of how far you are left and right and how far you are up and down. And now you could start to see how it might be an HMM. The HMM emits kind of uh, two real numbers. Each is controlled by a Gaussian that, where the mean of that Gaussian depends on the sound you're making. Right? Now it's starting to look like something you could build an HMM. Now, that's not really enough. If all you had was vowels, you couldn't say much. Right? You could say, uh, you could say, I. I. You could say, O. O. You. You. Uh. Uh. Yo, yo. Yo, yo. But okay. there's a little more to it. If you wanted to say something more than I-O-U, a yo-yo, you would probably have to have some consonants. OK. Um, but that's basically it. So somebody, said, uh, somebody asked about what's different when you say things different ways or different people. This is one speaker, but I think this is really cool. It's, it illustrates a lot. This is one speaker singing the vowel E better than that computer synthesizer does, singing it at a bunch of different notes. And what's cool about this is, E kind of has, uh, um, this is the vowel I, but it sounds like E. That has to do with messed up things that happened in English a couple of centuries back. Um, the envelope looks something like this, okay? And as you go higher and higher in frequency, that envelope doesn't really change, right? Octave after octave, the, the envelope of that sound um, doesn't change. But what happens is that fundamental pitch where you see multiples kind of uh, from left to right, the, the fundamental pitch goes up, right? This is really high, right? I couldn't sing that. And that means that the first frequency is a high frequency, and its first multiple uh, uh, is high, and all the other multiples are high. And so you start to see that it's, it's pretty hard to figure out here um, exactly which frequencies are in the envelope because you see such kind of spaced samplings of it. So um, I don't know, how many of you have been to the opera, right? So uh, opera is kind of hard to understand. Why is opera hard to understand? It's an Italian. Okay, fine. Okay, it's an Italian. Um, <laughs> even if you speak Italian, opera is hard to understand. And that's because by the time you get to these kind of very high notes, you ha you, singers are actually trained to move the envelope so it lines up with the actual underlying strength of uh, what they're singing. So you actually, people cheat their vowels. So weird stuff happens when you get into this regime, but you can see down in kind of speaking in kind of speaking regions, there's more or less an independence of the fundamental frequency in the envelope, and that's why speech can kind of be understood, whether it's kind of male speech or female street speech or child speech or whatever, um, even though there are very different fundamental frequencies. Okay, so um, maybe in our future is robot opera or something, but uh, it's a tricky thing. Okay, so. That was kind of uh, that was more or less the overview of what's going on in the speech phenomena. Now I'm going to tell you how you build an HMM. 
Um, and you basically build an HMM using two components. Part of it comes from a whole bunch of wave files and you learning which frequencies correspond to which sounds, right? That's a whole lecture in and of itself, but that's part of it. The other part is learning which sounds go together, and that's not really about sounds at all, it's about what words follow other words, okay? So here's what you do. You slice up every like 10 milliseconds or so, you take 25 milliseconds and do um, a Fourier transform to get the frequencies. There's like a little more signal processing than that, but that's, you know, to a first approximation, that's basically right. You end up with something like um, 39 real numbers, not just the two numbers I showed you for the vowels, you get a whole bunch more, but that's the basic idea. You get a bunch of real numbers that characterize the frequencies that are present. Um, those are your observations. You have one every 10 milliseconds. Now I need to know what are the states that correspond to those observations. And here what you do um, is you say the evidence, P of E given X, that is a probability distribution over these Fourier transform shapes um, and each sound. So, uh, you know, an E, an A, ah, an L, each sound has its own distribution over these vectors, okay? Secondly, you have a transition model, which says, what can follow an E? Well, kind of lots of things can follow an E, and it depends on the language you're speaking. Um, but the important thing is, get, if you're actually saying a sequence of English words, some sequences of sounds are more likely because they correspond to things you might actually say that wouldn't be complete gibberish. Okay, so the state space is going to basically have um, a sequence of positions in words, so you know I'm saying this sound, and then this sound, and then this sound, and the path you take through the state space is going to say which words uh, you are actually trying to say. Okay, so kind of just to zoom in on that a little bit, the states, now this is not a Bayes net, this has got loops in it all over the place, here each of the circles is a state in this giant HMM that you build for speech recognition. So this is the word need, okay, and one of the states is I am in the N part of the word need. That's this state right here. And when you're there, what do you do? You say you omit sounds that are characteristic of N, or at least characteristic of N in this uh, uh, acoustic context. And what do you do? Well, you stay there for a while. You sell flu. You might be there for like, you might be there for 40 milliseconds, and then eventually you move on to the next sound. And so you slowly work your way through the sounds in the word need. And if in your HMM inference, you decide you went through these states, that means you said the word need, okay? Now what happens when you finish the word need? You have to start another word. Which word should you start? What do people say after the word need? Sleep. So that tells you something about, uh, uh, <laughs> tells you something about um, your language model, I guess. But, um, but basically the idea is uh, what people say I mean, who knows, right? So uh, we, just, we just asked and, and um, somebody uh, generated from their own language model, but what we normally do is we go to like the web or some large corpus and we look up the statistics. So for example, you might have the word the, right? And so you go the the part and then the a uh part of the, and then when you're done saying the, you get to the state where you can transition to kind of any other word. Well, which words should you transition to after the? Well, you say, okay, well, there's maybe some grammar, like maybe that's nouns, but really you can just kind of hit the web and you can look what kind of uh, pairs of words or bigrams occur, right? So you grab, this is, a, this is from a survey, um, some Google data off the web um, of how many times each of a bunch of pairs of words occurred, right? So the most common thing you see on the web after the is first, then same, then following, then world, and then so on, and they decrease. And if you add them all up, there are this many tokens of the word the, and this many of them were followed by the word door, and so I can compute out the probability, right? Uh, you can be very sophisticated with this. This is the crudest thing imaginable. But you can just kind of divide them and say, it looks like 0.06% um, of the time, the is followed by door. And so I find the appropriate arc and I say, okay, 0.0006, right? And then I find, okay, the first, maybe that's a bigger percent and so on. So this is a big, it's a big HMM, right? It's a big state space because there are states not only for each sound, but for each position in each word. Right, so the number of states in this is like the number of words times the number of letters in a word, because letters roughly correspond to sounds. So it's a very, very, very big HMM. Um, and that's basically it, right? So you write that HMM down, it's a very big HMM, which means when you decode it, you do something that's a little bit more like particle filtering than exact in inference. You have multiple hypotheses you're decoding. Um, they're not sampled, because you're trying to find the best one and not sum over them. Um, uh, you do something instead that's called beam search, but what you have is you have a giant HMM, you, you basically chug through the Viterbi algorithm, which looks at every time step, has hypotheses of high-scoring things, extends it by one time slice, looks through at what words might follow, compares that to the sounds that it sees, and advance kind of advances 10 milliseconds at a time through your words, 
uh, through your acoustics. And then in the end, out pops a sequence of, here's the sequence of states that I think is most likely, and then you just read off the words, because the, word, the sequence of states kind of walk through words um, along the way. That's it, that's how speech recognition works. Um, let me stop there and see if we have any questions about speech recognition, and then I'm gonna leave you with maybe a, a brain teaser to open into machine learning next time. Questions about speech? Yep. Um, do you mean a kind of, it's, it, so you, the question about speech recognition and songs, are you talking about the kind of equivalent of music transcription or are you talking about when somebody's kind of singing on top of music? Yeah, so singing on, um, singing on top of music is hard, right? But actually recognizing speech on top of anything is hard. So if you've got like a, a kind of bus clanking in the background, that's hard. And if you've got two people talking at the same time, that's hard. One of the key ways people um, manage this, like you wonder how your cell phone figures out what you're saying given that there's all these other people talking and there's a bus is clanking and all of that, a lot of that is the microphones, right? By looking at different microphones, you can figure out what's near and what's far and kind of separate it away. Um, source separation is a big thing. Um, for music, if you can't do the source separation, yeah, it's really hard. And this isn't just for music. Also, if you're trying to recognize, trying to transcribe news and there's like a jingle playing in the background while the, the, the reporter's starting to, to talk, you can very easily have kind of overlapping, and we're so good at rejecting overlap, you don't realize how often I'm talking but somebody's coughing or whatever, and your brain just does it. It's really hard for these systems. Other questions? Okay, uh, I'm gonna leave you basically with a brain teaser. So uh, let's see. Machine learning, um, I'll talk about more, more stuff later, uh, but let's say Let's say we have a vat full of jelly beans, and some of them are red and some of them are blue, and we'd like to figure out what is the probability of a red jelly bean. So one way is we could go find a human jelly bean expert and say, in your vast experience, what fraction is, are, are red? And they'd be like, I don't know, a third, right? You get some number that's maybe reasonable, but it's certainly gonna be approximate. People aren't good at this. Or you could go to data, and you can kind of pull out a bunch of jelly beans and count them up. Now, if you counted them up, what would you get? Well, um, you might, uh, grab three jelly beans, and two of them would be red and one of them might be blue. Uh, we'll do a little bit more on this next time, but it would not be unreasonable on the basis of the sample to say, I'm gonna estimate two thirds of them are red, right? This would be better if instead of getting three jelly beans, I got three million jelly beans, I would eventually get the right, kind of more, uh, you know, central limit would take over and I eventually get uh, pretty good numbers. Um, but this is the kind of the core thing. This is the core of how um, estimating probabilities from data works. Uh, for machine learning is you just get a bunch of data and you kind of uh, estimate it. Now here's the problem, um, and here's the brain teaser I'll leave you with. I'm gonna leave you with, uh, um, I'm gonna leave you with something that Laplace thought very hard about, um, which was uh, the sun rising. Okay, and so what Laplace said is okay, the sun will not kind of rise every day, but every day we've ever recorded data about the morning, the sun has risen. So I say we've got like, you know, however, however many sunrises on record, all of them, every morning the sun has risen, and so the probability I would assign is 100%. Even though I have a lot of data, right, I would assign 100% probability that the sun will rise. But like, you know that someday the sun's like not gonna rise and we're all gonna panic and it's gonna be Armageddon or whatever. So like, there's some probability someday that something's gonna change. And the question is, on the basis of your data, this rare event never showed up. So, um, aside from worrying about the issue that kind of the sun rising and not, it's not like an independent event every day. Once it stops rising, maybe it's gonna never rise again. Um, if you just think about this, how do we deal with the fact that we have some prior belief that someday something else is gonna be different, so this thing shouldn't have probability zero, but it never occurs in our data? Okay, and we're gonna stop there. We'll pick that up next time, but what I want you to think about is what is the principled way for figuring out what's the probability of an event that you know can happen, but you've never seen in your data without just saying everything's equally likely and throwing away your data. We'll pick that up next time.